introduce Rick Ramgadi, who's going to give us a live demo presentation on shining a light on a black box, reverse engineering proprietary protocols in embedded devices. Please give a warm welcome to Rick. Hey, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me good? Guys, everyone in the back? I'm going to take that as a yes. Alrighty then, um, like you mentioned, my name is Rukram Gadi, and I tried to come up with a snazzy title, so it's called Shining a Light on a Black Box. In all reality, what it really covers is the process of reverse engineering custom protocols. I'm really hoping that the device behaves itself, and it's because it's still flashing its lights. We'll get around to that later on. So first, a little bit about myself. Like I mentioned, my name is Rukram Gadi. I enjoy doing these things. It's Mostly about building and hacking web applications, which is what I do at my day job, and reverse engineering custom protocols and mobile applications, and embedded device security. I got into embedded device security recently, or IoT security, as it's most oftenly referred to, because I work at Independent Security Evaluators, and we have a, I'm part of the research team. So next, a little bit about the people that paid for me to be here, because they will be watching this video. I work in Baltimore, Maryland for a security consultancy called Independent Security Evaluators. We also have an office here in San Diego, California, which is why we're here today. I do security assessments there, and that's what we all do there as well. <laughs> Most of the assessments, we do them from a white box perspective, but we'll do anything else from white box to black box or anything else in between. So here's the outline of what we're going to cover today. There's a lot. So full disclosure, I signed up for a 20-minute talk, and I didn't realize. I thought it was a one-hour talk this whole time, and I found out yesterday. So excuse me if it is a little bit, a little quick while I'm giving it. We're going to be talking about the Drobo 5N2, which is this snazzy device right here. We're going to be going over the process of how we identified attack surfaces, the passive testing that we did to identify what it is that we wanted to attack. We did active testing after we found other things that we wanted to hack. Then after that, there's going to be a live demonstration, which is I'm calling fun with lights. And then after that, if, time's allow if time allows, we'll try to get a shell, and I'll show you how easy it is. And then the wrap-up. First, we have the Drobo 5N2. The, the way that we found the Drobo 5N2 was that me and my coworkers were trying to find devices that we wanted to add to our research lab to identify vulnerabilities. The reason why we picked the Drobo 5N2 was because people were losing their minds over it on Reddit. And the reason why they were losing their minds over it on Reddit is because you can add more storage to it. And as you add more storage to it, it encrypts the drives, and it is marketed as a secure device, which is kind of ironic. Um, then after that, the reason why I thought it was kind of cool is because it has those really pretty lights on the front. And it's also a, an enterprise slash user type device. So some um, manufacturers, are, or I guess like some and organizations have it in their, inside of their offices. Some people have it in their houses. So the first thing that we have to do is that we have to identify attack surfaces on the Drobo. So usually when it's a network accessible device and we're trying to identify what it is that we want to look at, we look always towards Nmap. So now I'm just going to go over quickly the Nmap results. I added them into a file before I, I came to do the presentations to make things a little bit more quick. So let's look at those. And it's not coming up on there. Escape. Please hold while I try to fix the display on this. And the reason why I think I have to go through that right now is because I want to use both displays and not just my, not just the, the mirrored version, or I want the mirrored version. So here we go. Let's go look at the Nmap results right now. And hopefully that's visible to everyone. Everyone in the back good? I'll take that as a yes as well. Here are the ports that were open after we ran the Nmap scan. That makes it less visible. So port 445139, which is usually what you, it's usually SMB, right? Port 548, which is Netatalk. And then 5000 and 5001, which are mystery ports in this case. Let's go through and see what Nmap decided for us as well. So 139 and 445 are, in fact, SMB or Samba. Port 548 is, in fact, Netatalk. And then what about these mystery ports? The mystery ports say that port 5000 is UPnP question mark, which to me sounds like Nmap wasn't able to decide, wasn't able to figure out what it is that's running on that port. And 
from what we can see here, when the scanner connected to it, this XML data came back. That's very important. We should probably remember that for later on. Then on port 5001, similar thing happened. Except this time it says complex links, question mark, which is kind of new to me as well. And it returned some XML data, but there was also a bunch of other important, come back here, a bunch of other important information that was included in it. This time it included some of the bytes that came back. So we saw that there's a couple of nulls and an X1 and then more XML data. Cool. So looking at it, looks like port 5000 and 5001 are still pretty interesting. So let's see what happens when we connect to that just with Netcat. And I need to give it a port. Same thing came back again. So let's see what happened. It looks like when by default you connect to this device on port 5000, so there was no authentication. We just used Netcat, right? That was pretty much it. It returns all this information in XML. Let's see if anything is valuable. So it seems like it's pretty, just pretty normal. It gives you the firmware version, which is not the end of the world. Some things like the architecture used by the device, the firmware version as well. And let's see what else comes up. So it seems like it gives you the serial number, which is pretty interesting. And it gives you the status of when it was uh, last updated, the version that it's running. And nothing that really seems to be a game changer. So this is just information that if you, knew, if you knew that the owner is using an older version of the firmware, you could just guess these things, right? It's not really important. At least it isn't for now. So let's see what happens when we connect to port 5001. In this case, port 5001 doesn't really do anything, so it seems like it's probably waiting for us to issue a request. So let's, just, let's forget about that for now, since it didn't give us any information that we wanted back. There, there's two important things that I noticed when we were doing this. One, everything came back in plain text. So that's interesting. If you're interacting with something that's giving you back, when you're interacting with a device over a network protocol and it's giving you back all the information in plain text, that means that there's no transport layer security, right? Right. All right. And the other part is that there's no, there was no authentication required as well. That got me wondering, what did it, how is it that I can interact with, with this device if it's not over a web application? Most of the time when you have a NAS device, or any other embedded device, there's a web application involved and all that. In this case, there isn't. There's just this protocol. So trying to figure out how to interact with it is going to involve, A, trying to use the client that's used to communicate with the device, and B, trying to look at that network information. But it's not a web application. So you can't just attach Burp Suite to it and look at what's going on. In this case, I want to look at the traffic between my client and the device and see what's going on. So Wireshark seems like the best option here. Let's go ahead and look at Wireshark now. Where is Wireshark? I think that's visible. So for Wireshark in this case, we're going to look at everything that's going between the host and the client. Like I said, I recorded this beforehand, so it does have the IP addresses messed up. And all that matters right now is what's running, what it is that our client is sending to the device. So the ports that matter to us right now are port 5000 and 5001, right? So tcp.port equals 5000. And that already searched. Whoops. Well, let's look at what's going on there. When we do that, it's a very small version of what we saw before. I can't zoom in. Great. Um, it's a very small ver version of what we saw before. It is the XML data that came back when we connected to it on port 5000 with Netcat just now. So that seems pretty reasonable. Let's see now what happens when we look at port 5001. Looking at the traffic on port 5001, port 5001, we see that there is similar XML data. When we're looking at this XML data, something stuck out to me. It's using these things called CMD ID, and there's a number in between. And what ha this is the whatever is going between our client and the server. There are a couple of curious yet funny things about this. First of all is that we needed to authenticate the device in order to use it. What it did for that is that it just sent a bunch of Xs, and that was the form of authentication. There's another really interesting thing about this, and it's that there, there doesn't seem to be a requirement for usernames and passwords. Like I mentioned, this is all in plain text at this point. 
So there was no transfer layer security. There's no integrity checking or none of that. So let's see what happens at the beginning of this conversation. For that, let's switch over to the hex view to make things a little bit more visible. I'm gonna say that's visible. And we can see that, remember that serial number that we saw a while ago when you connected to it on port 5000? The serial number is actually your form of authentication. So theoretically, no, really practically, not theoretically, you can connect to these devices, get the serial number, and then begin to issue commands on the device. So like, well, that seems reasonable. I should only have it on my internal network. Well, that depends if you have it on your internal network, and it really doesn't seem practical when you think about attacks like SSRF, where you can issue queries to a device that's available on your local network. Not only that, because it's only the serial number, it's very easy to figure out what the rest of them in the world are. So now that we've figured out more or less what it is that the protocol looks like, we can start figuring out, it's like, well, how is it that you're gonna install other applications? We took advantage of this in, during our research to figure out that we can install whatever application we wanted to, and some of those were a web application to access the device, so you can, in fact, have that web application if you do want it. SSH, and the SSH credentials are the ones that you choose for it as well. You can install other services as well, such as MySQL, but there were really interesting problems with this, so Drobo as a company provides the device, and then after some times, they provide some of the applications, and then you can make them, you can also build your own. You can choose whichever one you want it to do, but one example is that they provide an installation of MariaDB or MySQL, and as soon as you connect to it, it immediately tells you what your password is back in the web application, because that's part of the intended functionality. And it's really, if you read the white paper that we have on the sort of the blog post, it, show, it says that in case you forget your password, here it is in plain text in the little web application. Hopefully we get enough time to go through some of those today. So getting back to the reverse engineering the protocol, the first thing that we tried was just sending these commands directly and seeing if we would get a response back. So I actually have that in a little Python script that I prepared for you today. And I also have a layout of what the protocol looks like at the beginning so that you guys can sh see that there's no nonsense going on. At the beginning here, the login preamble was the first request that we saw. The, this is just a hex version of the SSID, or sorry, the serial number or the MESAID, and it's just sent twice, then after the, rest of the end of it, this zero XDC is just the size of the rest of the request, and that's it. So, the structure is right here for you. So this is just saying that this message is being, every time it's sent, it's just that static string. After that we have the, if it's coming from or being sent to the server. The only one that's different in this case is actually the one that's being used to log in. So this one is the one for login. After that, the number changes. So here you can see that it's 0701, and then after that, commands are 0A01. We also see that the size has this many packets available to it. For those of you that are probably still paying attention, are they, you're probably thinking about like, oh, what if I mess with the size and make it smaller or bigger? If you make it bigger, the server just waits for the rest of the message to come, so that'd be a nice way to stop the, the, or to cause some type of havoc. And then if it's smaller, it just errors out. So for this, I specified the IP, it's gonna be dot 12 hopefully still, and it's gonna be listening on port 5001. And then after that, it set a, a source port and the buffer size. The buffer size is just to receive the response. And then the command 26. Command 26 is actually the command used to start the lights on the device, which I hope is still on. And hopefully, if this is still working, it'll turn on the lights as soon as I issue this, re this request with the Python script. The lights turn on? This is when you clap. <laughs> so lucky for me, I have five minutes left, so let's try to SSH on the device now. So usually, after you have a way to get into the device, in this case, we install SSH, and this is partially working. I don't know why it's slashed. But in the Jobo apps, which is what I mentioned before, man, this looks terrible. Um, what we mentioned before, you have the ability to install applications, which you can't see right now. But one of them was SSH, and one of them was a web application. So 
when auditing embedded devices or any type of application for that sense, usually if it's an interpreted language like PHP, you can just connect to the device and view all the files, right? So that's probably the easiest way to get a shell. So in this case, let's just get one right now. If we SSH onto the device, which is a little small, I want all of you to see, on port 2222, 2222, which is not currently connected, um, you, can, you would be able to SSH on the device and look at the web application. Let's see now if we have the ability to open up a browser and connect to it. So connect to 112, Drobo Access is the name of the application, which is sadly not on. <laughs> so let's see now if we can figure this out here with all of you together. So in right now, the Drobo, after we issued our request, is in an error state, which is approximately going to take an hour to fix. So I, I don't have an hour left, so I apologize for that. But what I do have time for is explaining more of the protocol. So here we see some of the requests that came out. Some of the other ones is the ability to list all of the available applications on the device. So here, for example, is the request to see the list of users on the device, which in this case is just going to return one because it's the admin user, and it X's out the password. But you don't really need it because it's an unauthenticated protocol, so it doesn't really matter. Some of the other ones as well is this request to return all of the information that's currently on the device. So it has really cool features, like it tells you the current temperature of the device, current temperature of the drives, if the drives are not working like it is right now. And you can also see other information, like the network information, the MAC address, if you want to see the SSID again, the M-E-A-S-S-I, or S-I-D. There's also other requests so that you can view the uptime, the temperature, and there's another request for removing installed applications. So some of the ramifications for this is that if you, have, if you are aware of a Drobo device on anyone's network, you can, with unauthenticated access, un without authentication, you can access the device, install whatever application you want, get a shell, and then after issue requests from that device inter into their internal network, or just use it as part of a botnet, which I think is pretty popular nowadays with embedded devices. The other problem is that you could actually, this device is a little pricey. It's around the $500 mark. So you could technically just kill it by removing every, or just RMing the slash directory and removing everything else from there, or just doing other things to affect the device. And other things, you can also turn on the lights if you wanted to. So now that we've covered that, I think that we have hit the end part of my slide. So I'll put up the Fiend one. And that's it. I hope you guys had an enjoyable time and that my speedy presentation was usable. <laughs>